seven men uh, set out to go hunting on uh, November 15th, 2015 on you know the lily pond road area near brant lake one of tom's friends uh sid uh sid sharp we'll call him sid senior because he has a son also named sid he made the ultimate decision that day to go hunting in the lily pond road area and this is interesting because while they are very experienced hunters in this area they had never hunted this road before so they they didn't know the area the the immediate area they were hunting in okay so they knew the park but they went to a different spot of the park that they hadn't hunted yet yeah so they they're in a different area that never never hunted before and the members of the hunting party that i could find were obviously tom uh rob which is tom's son sid senior al who was a friend of tom joe capicelli which was another friend of tom who uh, sadly died in 2016 there was sid jr uh, the son of Sid, and then there was another unidentified man. I'm assuming he might have been a son or a friend, uh, but I, I wasn't able to figure out who the seventh um, individual of the hunting party was. Okay. So, like we said, they were all experienced hunters. They knew the area. Everyone in the group had walkie-talkies that was on the same channel, and it was reported that Tom knew how to use his walkie-talkies, so you'd assume if something had happened, if he had fallen or you know got lost he would be on that walkie talkie right away lily pond road is an uneven dirt road that goes for about two miles and it would take about 12 minutes to drive it by car roads basically just a straight shot up to the lake where you park so it's not hilly it's not really curvy it's you know just a straight dirt road basic dirt road basic forest road yeah We, we have you know tens of miles of those up north so so we're jumping forward to lunch on 11 15. the group got off to a late start that day so they didn't get up there until about noon and they only really planned to hunt for about two hours and then they were going to head back to their camp the uh, plan was and we've actually i remember doing this when i was younger when i they were hunting deer by the way so i remember doing this kind of when i was a kid hunting with my uncles but the plan was to have the old guys kind of walk down the road in kind of a hundred yard increments and then they would they would stop and then they'd go in the woods about 30 or 40 yards and then sit down they called these guys the watchers so they basically would sit on a stump or a, a rock or something and wait for a deer to you know run by and then they would shoot it oh so they're doing a drive that's what they they're call doing a deer, deer drive. drive yeah okay so the older guys literally would walk in and sit and spread out by a hundred yards walk yep. in 34 so they could probably see the road but they'd sit on a stump or something and just yep. wait they would okay. just sit there and wait and you know if anything ran by they would you know they would shoot at it so the first watcher was sid the second was joe capicelli the third the third i believe was rob and the fourth was tom who was for no rob was one of the the guys driving the deer i think the third was might have been al and the fourth was tom who was the furthest from the lake Okay. So they had all the older guys sitting and the younger guys were driving driving the deer to them. Okay. So the other three hunters, which they called the younger guys, <laughs> uh, they followed a trail that went along the lake and then came up to a snowmobile trail and they hopped that into the woods and they were planning to kind of swing back up to Tom in a counterclockwise motion. So if you're you're listening, you know, kind of picture you know you've got the old guys kind of in a line a vertical line and then to the right of them there's a trail that kind of curves around by the lake and they were gonna the younger guys were gonna take that trail and then kind of curve counterclockwise back up to uh where the old guys were sitting almost like closing a door yeah like like it's like they had a hint the hinge was the lake and then they had like the the opening of the doors where the old guys were sitting and then the, the younger guys were gonna went, come down and basically shut it and drive any deer or any wildlife that were there past the old guys exactly so okay. and it was described by people on the hunt you know very slow um kind of hunting style that you know they're not sprinting through the woods they're walking really slow mm-hmm. you know making you know trying to make some noise to kind of spook the deer ahead of them forward as we're you know as they're doing this hunt sid the younger guy he mentioned that they didn't see any deer on the hunt or no, I apologize. This was Sid Sr. 
So okay. Sid Senior mentioned that they didn't see anything, but he claimed to hear a like a strange noise in the woods, and he didn't know what it was. And he he said in an interview that I saw that it was different than what you would usually hear out in the woods. So it wasn't an animal sound. It wasn't you know maybe a deer rutting or snorting. I I've heard you've anyone hunting's heard that kind of sound before. Yeah. And these guys have been hunting for decades, so well, they would that's, know that's exactly. The thing too. So if there, yeah, if there's someone on this listening to the show now that isn't hunting, that might seem weird to them, but I've been hunting since I was a kid and you start recognizing, I can tell the difference between a squirrel running through the grass, a chipmunk running through the grass, a deer walking, a person walking. You can actually start differentiating those sounds. Yeah. So if you have someone who's a regular hunter um, that hunts more than even I did saying it's a strange sound, I think it's very reasonable to listen to that as something that's unidentifiable. Yeah. So, and like I said, he, he said it's something he's never heard before. And it was a very quick sound, like one or two seconds. And he, he says in one interview that it almost sounded like a trap closing. So that's a really, a strange kind of sound. I'm picturing like a, you know, like a big bear trap, like closing one of those you, you've seen where you step yeah, in the like middle and metal it like, claws. Yeah. So Sid estimated the sound was about 150 yards away from him, which would have been in range of Tom. And it kind of came from the top of this hill that was in the middle of all of these men. And it was the sound was kind of towards where Tom was sitting. So, you know, later on in the, the search, Sid Sr. mentions this to the police and they literally pass it off as nothing. And Sid said they never brought it up again. That's interesting. Yeah, you would think something that sounded like a trap closing or a strange sound like that, you would maybe put a little more effort in investigating that. But, you know, I guess at the time they didn't think it was a big deal. Mm -hmm. So, all right, now we're moving forward in the day. So now it's about 3 o'clock on the 15th, and the hunt's wrapping up. The group hasn't spotted anything, so they're, they're heading back to their car. They all get to the car, but there's no Tom. They're, you know, they're kind of figuring, well, maybe he's, you know, taking his time. Uh, so they start, they call him on his walkie talkie, nothing. They start. So, so Sid senior, basically when he heard that sound, I know we talked about how he told the cops, it was weird. Like yep. that happened before they knew Tom was not there, but yeah. it was something that he heard it was like, oh, that was strange. Like, okay, no big deal. Now it's three o'clock in the afternoon. They're getting back to their car, which they had planned. And I'm guessing they were probably calling on the radios and stuff too. Yeah. And you're saying, so Tom didn't, Tom's not there now when they're back. No. So yeah, they get back from the car or they get back to their, there's two cars. They get back to the cars. No Tom. So yeah, they, they instantly like, all right, he's just taking his time. So they try the walkie talkies. They hear nothing. So at this point they start looking for him. They look, they, they go down the road, they walk into the woods, everywhere where Tom would have been nothing. So they start firing shots off into the air, hoping he would hear them. Mm -hmm. And anyone who's been, you know, up north in the woods, you can hear gunshots from miles away. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it kind of echoes through the woods. And it would be, even with someone that's got hearing aids, it would be pretty easy to to hear that shot, kind of sense what direction it's coming from and walk that way if you were you know, missing. Absolutely. And you got to remember, they didn't go very far. They went, you know, a couple hundred yards down the road and then into the woods. So they're firing shots off. And we're talking about an 82-year-old man that's not going to get very far. He's not. Yeah, it's not like he's running away or something like that. No. And even if he like started wandering in the wrong direction. Yep. Uh, it's not deep back country. It's no. a wooded area. Eventually, they search. They're shooting their guns off. Nothing. One of the members of the group decides to head down the road. I guess there was um, a ranger station or a, an office somewhere not too far away. So they went down there to inform the rangers that they've got a missing hunter. We are fast forwarding to the evening now on the 15th. Last light uh, at the time was 7.34 p.m. Mm -hmm. So the group is all still by their cars and they make a decision at this point to split up. One group was going to stay with one of the cars at the spot where they parked and they were going to periodically honk the horn at night and shoot shots off you know, in the hopes that maybe Tom, maybe if he wandered off, he could hear it and, you know, head back to the car. Sure. The other group was going to go back into town and inform the authorities that Tom's obviously missing. 
And it's also at this time that Tom's son, Rob, called his wife to inform to inform her that he was missing. Okay. So you, you think about timelines here. They started hunting at noon. Now it's, you know, seven hours later. And I would say, you know, the authorities have been told and Tom's wife's been told. So Yeah, they're getting they're getting pretty nervous. Yeah. And I mean this is this is what you want to see in a search. You want to see it happen quickly because the sooner you start searching, the better chance you have of finding someone alive. Absolutely. Starting on the morning of the 16th is when the formal search started. The main group that was running the search at this point was the New York State Forest Rangers. Okay. And they were running it out of a town nearby called Horicon. And this is a, a very you know small town of 1,350 people, close-knit community. I remember reading some of the reports. The um, I believe it was the mayor or the, the supervisor of the town was coming into work, and he saw a state forest ranger helicopter landing in like an open patch of grass. And he's like, huh, that's strange. Yeah. <laughs> so um, the town of Horicon is the kind of the, the, the headquarters for the search operation. During the initial search efforts, I read that under Sheriff Sean, and I'm going to butcher this last name, so I apologize. I believe it's Lamore. Yeah, I think that's right. That looks right. He had a really interesting comment about the area where Tom went missing, kind of a little spooky. He said that when they initially got up to the area to start the search, that it was completely devoid of wildlife. They didn't see squirrels, chipmunks, deer, or any sign of animals up there. Wow. And that's, I mean, for that time I, of the know, year too, when they're like, it's winter prep and they're running around like crazy or supposed to be at least. When you're out in the woods, you hear birds chirping. I mean, it's a very live place. There's lots of animals, squirrels. A lot of times you'll be walking down the trail and there'll be squirrels in the trees. Kind of, they get mad at you and they like, they make noise. You know, they're upset that you're walking by. Oh yeah. So that. That's a, uh, to me, that's really strange that the area seemed devoid of wildlife, like nothing. And, that, and that's another thing too. It's um, strange because you have a guy who's, you know, a forest ranger or an undersheriff for that area. So he's in that area, probably spends a lot of time in the woods and he's saying it's weird. So it's not like an outside group came and was like, oh, there's no wildlife here. But then if you talk to a local, they're like, oh, there's really never really anything up there. If he's from the area and thinks it's weird, that's, I think, a big indicator that something is off. So according to the undersheriff, the the first uh, SAR group to get up there was the Warren County Emergency Response Team uh, that consisted of 13 professionally trained team members. So these guys, they're not volunteers. They, you know, they're professionally trained to do search and rescue missions. So you've got a, a good group of people up there with, you know, the knowledge and how to conduct a professional search and like you said before you're talking first thing next morning 13 pros are out there less um, than 24 not, hours yeah not trampling the area not yep. ruining the search effort by just you know traipsing into the woods outside of what the other guys already did so they they it seems like they got off to a fantastic start in what you'd want to have happen out of a lot of the cases we've looked at this by far i i really applaud the the officials uh in that area for getting uh, such a massive operation going this quickly because in addition to the Warren County emergency response team, uh, the air national guard also deployed a helicopter with uh, FLIR and the state police had helicopters on location as well. And then in addition to the assets in the air, they also, the New York state de uh, corrections department had canine units and canine units on the ground. And then there were other volunteer SAR teams that had additional canine units. So, but they're all being led by trained people. Yeah, and uh, one firefighter from that town uh, interviewed on this case estimated that there were 50 to 60 organizations in total at the, the peak of the search and rescue operation. So uh, this is a pretty massive uh, search and rescue operation that gets kicked off in a very short amount of time. They mentioned that in tandem with a lot of the, the units in the air, they had hundreds of searchers canvassing every square inch of that area where Tom went missing. They were walking through swamps and you know muddy areas up to their their waists. Literally, one one of the sons said, for a mile, you could see you know you had people that were like almost standing next to each other, and if you, you looked the wrong way, you might trip over them. So, Jeez. and that's funny too because like they're 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 covering the easy areas, but they're also covering the areas that an eighty year old man is not going to go into. Yeah, 
And they did another uh, a cool thing that I, we haven't read about in our other cases where they were using string and they were creating things called bump lines. So picture, picture a big rectangle. And on the top and bottom of the rectangle, you have these bump lines. So they're basically stringed off areas, you know, tied from tree to tree. It didn't specify how far they go. I'm assuming, you know, probably 100 yards or 50 yards or whatever they do. And then with in between those bump lines vertically, they would they would walk from the top bump line and the bottom bump line. So I'm trying to describe this for people listening. So you've got your rectangle. So on the right side of the rectangle, on the vertical area between the bump lines, you had people every couple feet and you would walk in 25 yards. Then you would tie a string from the lower bump line to the upper bump line. And then that area has been searched. Okay. So eventually they had physical string and they had box off an area that essentially literally you have people every couple feet. So it's quite literally every square inch has been searched. And then you knew that that area had been looked at. So you wouldn't. Yep. Okay. So, wow. So not only were they by a map coordinating the effort, they were physically marking searched areas so that they wouldn't double search or miss spots. Yeah. One of his sons said the forest looked like a spider web. There were so many strings, you know, tied to trees in the areas that they uh, had searched. So that's a really interesting search method that we've not, encountered in our other cases yet and i think that's important too because i always thought about like it seemed like the from the pictures i saw too of the area these woods weren't really dense or thick but i always wondered like in some of these searches like is it so thick that you think about some of those areas where we've heard people talk about it's so thick that someone could be a foot or two away from you and you might not even know it if they're laying there motionless dead yep so like that's where this would come into play really well but this is an area where they're doing this method in an area that doesn't have as much thickness as that. Plus, again, the time of the year. Time of the year, a lot of the leaves are, exactly. are on the ground. All the foliage um, would be dead. So, I mean, you wouldn't have a lot of that, that stuff going on. Yeah, so it's a, it's a really interesting search method. I would uh, Maybe someday we'll, we'll give our friend a call from Colorado again to see how often he's aware of these bump lines being used um, in searches. You know, yeah, it seems effective to me. So one of the one of the sons had mentioned that at, at the peak of the search there were probably 300 people up there in the woods at any one point. So we're talking a, a massive search operation. And there was so much activity up in the woods. People in Horicon were you know kind of like, who went missing? Was it like the governor's son, or they thought <laughs> like a dignitary went missing out in the woods? <laughs> wow, they just had so many people. They're just like baffled by the the scale of the operation. And at this point, people, people had no theory on what really happened to him. You know, one theory was maybe he, he wandered out to a paved road and was hit by a car. So they actually had searchers checking the ditches of all the main roads in the area to, to see if maybe he got hit. And then, you know, maybe he was tossed off to the side of the road. They found nothing. You know, the family mentioned that after a couple days of the search, they they knew something you know happened to him and it wasn't good and his you know his sons throughout this search were just kind of in disbelief they didn't find anything yeah that's i mean he had a gun he had food he had clothing like so you like well even the under sheriff he you know he he says that it's really like if you drop your rifle that's not going to blow away that's not going to wash away you're going to find it they didn't find his rifle they didn't find clothing they didn't find anything they didn't find tracks. I mean, it's it's like he just vanished off the face of the earth, which is uh, just bizarre. So the first day of the search, it's getting ramped up. There's a lot of people out there, a lot of assets in the air, lots of canine units on the ground. Uh, day two starts up, and uh, the search was hampered uh, severely by uh, really heavy rains that day. So uh, it's always interesting. I you see this in a lot of the cases, and I know the uh, the guy who writes the Missing 401 books, um, this is kind of a key to all his disappearances, is there's always strange weather events that hamper the search. And this is no different. Yeah, so this was no different. There was a, a really bad uh, rainstorm. On well, and I think it's important that they had canines out there before the rain occurred. So they did have they did have dogs out there trying to pick up scent before the rain event. So yeah. 
and they didn't find anything, which is insane because they know exactly where he was. Like they, they know exactly where he was. So they would exactly. have started from where he was sitting. They know, I think they even said they knew the, like the log he was sitting on. Yeah. So they had a good idea of where he was and they couldn't even track a scent from that point. Day two of the search doesn't, doesn't go well. It rains, you know, heavy rains all day. Uh, day three, they search. Now this, this is where it starts getting really bizarre. So on the fourth day, so this is November 19th now, two FBI agents show up uh, to the, the search and rescue operation. Anyone who is probably in law enforcement is familiar with this, and I, I had to research it, but according to FBI protocol, they, they, don't, they don't get involved with the search for missing people unless it's a small child or if it's like an abduction by a family member. Or I'm sure like a serial killer, like ongoing investigation as serial killers, things like that. They definitely don't show up to search and rescue operations for like elderly people. Yeah. That's highly unusual. You know, the local law enforcement officials running this search operation were kind of puzzled that the FBI had showed up. Some thought they were there to provide some sort of tech technological support, but they said most of the local officials uh, never even had contact with the agents. Because it would be different if it was requested, but from what your notes are saying, it wasn't even there. And, and David Politis himself, I mean, he was an investigator. He was baffled by that. I know he talked about it in his book. And the uh, the local law enforcement officer in charge of the search effort said he had never seen the FBI get involved in a search like this before. So it was a new one for him. And, it, you know, it just left kind of everyone involved kind of, all right, what what's the FBI doing here? Is there something more going on that we don't know about. The FBI did have a conversation with Tom's wife. All they said to her, a very brief conversation, they told her that they were there. They were there to tell her that they now considered him a missing person and they felt that something definitely was not right. But unless and until they made a recovery, they wouldn't know what it was. That's all they said to her. How cryptic is that? <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, that's so weird. <laughs> Yeah, they said uh, they, he's a missing person and something definitely was not right about it. My mind just races with uh, theories and weird, you know, I guess did they, theories, did they, but... they didn't show up in a black crown Vic, did they? <laughs> was it uh, Fox and Scully? Yeah, I know. <laughs> the agents, after they, they made their way to Horicon, they eventually made their way up to the search area, you know, Lily Pond Road, and they just started to monitor the effort. They were taking notes and writing reports. From what I read, these reports would get sent to a behavioral analysis, a behavioral analysts in Virginia. So their job is to look for other cases that match the profile that they're, you know, writing the reports about. I don't know if the FBI thought that maybe there's a serial killer that. Wow. So yeah, I want that. Yeah, and there's something that matches. Yeah, it's weird, and from what I was able to research, there's historical reports dating back to the 1960s that show the FBI has monitored numerous missing person cases that are, are strangely similar to uh, this case. I don't know if there's something the FBI is aware of that they're, they're like, okay, these cases all have similar things in common. We better, we better send some people up there to monitor it, but it's just a really bizarre aspect of this yeah they like make it worse by not explaining what they're doing there just kind of like sitting in the back taking notes and then being like okay like we said the fbi show up on the 19th they're very cryptic and why they're there they're not talking to anyone and they they blast out of there you know pretty quickly uh the formal search for tom ended on november 26th you know there's been a lot of news articles since his disappearance that you know, search efforts have continued uh, with family and friends and people hunting and hiking out in there, and they have not found a single item of his belongings. Nothing. No clothing, no bones, no gun, nothing. That's crazy. Yeah. So it's, it's a bizarre case, and I, I did some research too. I want to make a side note here. There was another missing person case 
that happened on the 10th day of Tom's search, about 40 miles south of where Tom went missing, it was an older gentleman again, and he was, I think he was out, he, he lived on a rural farm with his wife, he was a retired supervisor from his town, he was an avid outdoorsman, his wife left on Thanksgiving Day to go to a banquet, and when she returned in the afternoon, her husband was gone. His car was there, all of his belongings were in the house, but he had simply vanished. It was. This is interesting because not only the, the two people that went missing were similar and the circumstances were similar, but the state of New York pulled off all of their rangers from the missing Tom's case to go search on this case on the 10th day. And they, it was a huge operation again. They had helicopters, K-9 units, and the eventual outcome was exactly the same. They never found a single wow, thing of the only, guy. You said it was only 40 miles south of where Tom disappeared? Yep. I, I would say the name of the city it's near, but I'll just butcher it. It's uh, uh, Schoilerville. <laughs> Schoilerville. Schoilerville. <laughs> <laughs> I, that's that's my best guess. Yeah, and this guy was 68 years old. So it's just a side note. It Another interesting piece of this case that, all right, you've got Tom that went missing, and now just 40 miles south, 10 days later, another another guy, similar circumstances, goes missing, and then nothing's found of him. So uh, it's it's very coincidental that those two things happened so close to each other. That's that's crazy. So I. 